Good afternoon and welcome to the second installment of WPI's webinar series, Between the Two, Art and Sexuality in 1960s New York. I'm Huffa Frobes Cross, project manager of the Tom Wesselman Digital Corpus and Catalog Resonate. And I just wanna thank you all for joining us this afternoon. Um, over the course of four talks throughout June, we will share the work of art historians explaining the ways in which questions of gender and sexuality were integral to the development of the art of 1960s New York. Each talk in between the two will explore these questions by focusing on specific artists and broader themes that run through the art and culture of New York in the 1960s. Future talks in the series will be by Rachel Middleman on June 22nd this week uh, and Kathleen Chaffee on June 29th. You can register for all the talks on our website at wpi.art under the News and Events tab, subheading Upcoming Events. You can also watch our first talk by David Getze um, on the Wildenstein Plattner Institute's YouTube page. Uh, between the two uh, arose out of a desire to expand on themes present in both Tom Wesselman's work and his papers, which the WPI has made available free of charge through its digital archive platform. And we invite you to browse this archive, which contains photographs, correspondence, and press clippings related to the artists, dealers, and other key figures involved in the art scene of post-war New York. We hope you'll take a moment to explore our holdings on our website at wpi.art slash archives. Um, it is now my pleasure to introduce our featured speaker, Joshua Lubin-Levy. Josh is a scholar, dramaturg, and curator currently working on a monograph on the photography and performance work of Jack Smith. He is the director of the Center for the Arts at Wesleyan University editor-in-chief of the Movement Research Performance Journal and a curatorial research associate with the Whitney Museum of American Art. This afternoon, he will be presenting his talk, E.G., Evening Gown Orgy, Jack Smith and Abstract Gender in the 1960s, which focuses on a live performance that precedes Smith's iconic 1963 film, Flaming Creatures. There will be a Q&A afterwards, and please put your questions in the Q&A box and not the chat, um, and I will attempt to integrate as many as possible. And so now uh, I'll hand it over to Josh. Thank you so much. Um, thank you to the WPI and Jancy and Huffa and Claire, and um, really it's been such a pleasure to return to some of this Jack Smith material and, and think through gender, sexuality, and eroticism in the 1960s, which is a, such a big topic. Um, and so I thank you for that, uh, this invitation, and also for so much understanding about having to reschedule my original date. I really appreciate that. Um, so I am going to be speaking about, um, as I share my slides, uh, the work of Jack Smith, who I've spent um, more than a decade now um, immersed in Jack Smith's um, archive, and, and um, I'll talk a little bit about who Jack Smith is. I want to give a, a quick um, note up front that I do use a word that is um, rather controversial today, but that was part of the lexicon that Smith was using to think about gender. Um, he uses the word transvestite uh, throughout his work, and, and of course, we might want to problematize the way in which that word was used then, but also certainly the way it's used now. Um, so there's something slightly antiquated in, in Jack's use of that phrase. Um, and what I'll be talking about today is um, uh, certainly Jack Smith and his central role in um, really uh, foregrounding the, the kind of influence and the importance of non-normative gender and sexuality um, in art of the 1960s. But um, I want to put Smith's work in dialogue with some of the um, larger conversations happening around uh, abstraction uh, coming out of the 1950s and into the 1960s. And I just wanted to make a, a few remarks about this. You know, I think it's interesting to think about Jack Smith's work in relationship to abstraction, both because um, he claims himself in some ways a uh, oh, dialogue with abstract art in his work, but also because pop art would be the more uh, kind of familiar or go-to 
uh, reference for Jack Smith, who was a queer artist working in the 1950s and 60s, um, all the way up till his death in 1989 of AIDS-related illness, and whose work largely relied on references to Hollywood and movie stars and glamour. So there's really like a pop undertone to the work. But there's also something very um, much about pop that Smith resisted. Um, I'm also really interested in thinking about abstraction as it was living in the kind of art world of the 1960s, but in relationship to the way in which we might have think about abstraction in contemporary gender um, theory or queer and trans studies um, as a kind of right to being abstract, uh, kind of um, against the, the maybe we could say kind of disciplinary necessity to disclose gender and sexuality that uh, queer and trans subjects especially face and, and especially, I would say, today. So these are some of the things that are circulating around my talk. And I'm going to start with talking about Jack Smith in the 60s, and then I will get back to this topic of, um, of abstraction. So just to pick up on the, the brilliant talk that Professor Getze gave last, last week, and I was remarking on how I'm so glad I didn't have to go first, because there's just so much to say about gender and sexuality and, and art of the 1960s. And um, Professor Getze really kind of so deftly moved through such a breadth of material um, with such a precise um, kind of uh, reading of this period. On the one hand, um, citing the way in which gender and sexuality, especially queer um, and trans embodiment was very much part of the criminal or outlaw figure from this period. Um, and that figure is, is kind of often codified around a certain, certain kind of like uh, a hardened subjectivity. Kenneth Anger Scorpio rising with that leather jacket um, is such the iconography of the queer outlaw from the 1960s. And yet what I loved about Professor Getz's talk was the gesture to thinking past the iconography and, and really getting into some of the ways in which queerness and transness might inhabit the kind of behavioral um, aspects or the behavior that we see performed throughout this period. Um, and I, I was really interested in, in the reference to this work by uh, called Portrait of Jason, which is a portrait of Jason Holiday by the filmmaker Shirley Clark. That's really this very intimate portrait of Jason Holiday just kind of sharing all of his uh, kind of antics, getting drunk on camera, talking about his sexual encounters, and that this, this self-mythologizing, but also self-disclosure of Black queer life in the 1960s in such an intimate setting is a, a really rare portrait and a real turn in this moment where um, of the 60s where both photography and film are increasingly interested in authenticity and the real and kind of coming out of the cinema verite moment. But I'm also really interested in Portrait of Jason because Jason Holiday embodies a kind of queer subjectivity, a kind of relationship to gender that's much softer, we could say, than the kind of masculinity we see in the Kenneth Anger biker model, the kind of rebel without a cause. And that this softer masculinity is exactly what Jack Smith would claim for himself what I'm showing you here is uh, something that I found in Jack Smith archive, which is a copy of a review of the screening of Portrait of Jason at NYU, done in the NYU newspaper Heights Daily News from 1967. And it's on a, the back of this, cop, this review that Jack Smith actually writes out his bio in 1967. So this kind of amazing way in which Smith parallels himself to Holiday. And he writes, Jack Smith, born 1932, Columbus, Ohio, left college in 1952 because, quote, I suspected I was somehow being kept from learning. In Hollywood, studied dance with Ruth St. Dennis. In New York, studied directing with Lee Strasberg, witchcraft with Joseph Castor at the New School for Social Research. Jack Smith grows up actually in Galveston, Texas, moves to Columbus, Ohio, and Chicago for a period, has a brief stint in Los Angeles, and then comes to New York in the early 1950s. And when he comes to New York, he's a photographer for the most part, but he also gets deeply involved in the emerging experimental cinema scene, primarily as a performer. Whether or not he ever studied with Ruth St. Dennis, I've never been able to confirm. He may have taken uh, a, a St. Dennis class in LA. Um, he did take a class 
on witchcraft and the occult with Joseph Castor at the New School. I have no idea if he studied with Lee Strasberg. Um, and so there's this wonderful way in which Smith's bio becomes what all bios are, which is a kind of self-mythologizing and a play with fact and immutability of how we think about who Jack Smith is, but certainly the references he would collect in order to create the kind of idea of the artist that he wanted us to see. Smith was very much immersed in this underground performance scene, as well as the kind of emerging queer scene. And it's both of these things that he's best known for in the 1950s as sort of this gateway for a number of, we could say, straight artists to access this queer scene, this drag scene. Um, as a photographer, he has big aspirations to have work published in Vogue and Harper's Bazaar. And uh, he, in some ways, models himself. Some have speculated on a Richard Avedon figure. But he starts by publishing a lot of his photographs in pornography magazines like Scene Entertainment for Men, where in 1962, he publishes this um, photo essay called New York, the Underworld. And the editors of the magazine describe how Jack Smith has given us a portrait of um, the fringe of the subconscious, the shadow world between the normal and the perverse, including a Greenwich Village party haunted by transvestites, which is made uncomfortably visual. So there's this way in which the editorializing is about depicting these scenes as a kind of abjection. And there's a couple things that interest me in this as a model of thinking about how Smith is playing with and against gender and sexuality um, in the 1960s. One is that there's this idea that what Smith is making uncomfortably visual is the quote transvestite party, party that, that he has some access um, or kind of uh, an interest in creating representation around a disobedience to normative, the normative gender binary and specifically visualizing or depicting the breakdown of the polarity between male and female. Um, that in the description offered by the editors, there's this gesture to the subconscious, right? And so there's also this way in which this essay um, gestures to or signals just how influential psychoanalytic theory was in culture, uh, thinking about gender and sexuality at this time. And this is an era where psychoanalysis is widely kind of dis disseminated and practiced throughout the United States. And one of the things that especially Freud's theory of gender gives us is a developmental model of gender that thinks not only about gender as innate, as born, but as something that one develops into. And because of that, because of course, if anyone's familiar with it, you'll know, or with Freud's theories, you'll know about the kind of different um, stages, the oral, anal, and the genital um, stage, um, that because there's this sense of the normative development of the gendered or the sexualized subject, there are all sorts of opportunities for that development to go awry. Um, which is partly um, one of the ways in which we get um, one of the most profound impacts around um, non-normative gender and sexuality during this period, the policing, the criminalization, and just the wide sweeping cultural anxieties during the Cold War that would suggest that there was a homosexual menace kind of seducing young boys and young girls into quote unquote homosexual lifestyles that one could be pulled off course by these influences. And this has had resounding impact in the way that gender and sexuality are even thought today. So there's this way in which Smith is playing with this sense of gender and sexuality as something that develops over time, but that also has a kind of mutability to it, whether that's anxiously mutable or, or, or seen as, as very liberatory. And that's the last thing that I'll say about this, that it not only focuses on bodies, in this um, photo essay, but the spaces as well. You can see there are a lot of, of seemingly kind of open landscapes or kind of areas that really depict um, a, a great amount of detail in the spaces, the Greenwich Village scene or Central Park, the Brooklyn Cemetery. That there's something about certain areas of the city being where this kind of gender disruption and sexual disruption is occurring. And that this was part of the theorizing about the liberatory nature of thinking about gender and sexuality as a kind of progression, as an evolution. Um, that you have theorists like Herbert Marcuse who are talking about the idea that 
if one develops into sexuality and into gender, and gender and sexuality are so codified in the way American culture exists, or we could say civilization, to use Freud's work, word, exists, that in some ways a return to or an exploration other ways of being in and experiencing sexuality and gender could lead to other forms of civilization. So what I'm trying to suggest is that there's not only this intense repressive quality to thinking about gender in the Freudian landscape, but this liberatory possibility as well. And that's what Smith was really known for or became known for, that all of his exploration of the way the body figured into the frameworks of gender and sexuality as they exist in the 1960s might not only be liberatory for queer and trans um, individuals, but that it could be actually liberatory for all of us to explore this new sensuous relationship to the body, a kind of un unhemmed in or kind of un uncontained by the pragmatism and the disciplinary nature in which male and female or heterosexuality was being thought at the time. So we have these sort of two aspects that I just want to make sure that I'm hitting, and then I'll move on from this. But that one is, of course, that this is a period where because of the sense of the kind of movement in gender and sexuality, there was intense policing going on. Um, this was hit home quite directly for Smith and his colleagues working in the downtown scene as police would often raid bars, but also cinemas and theaters seeking out what Gail Rubin describes, describes as the specter of the sex offender or the homosexual menace. And on this other hand, this desire to push against that very famous phrase that comes from Freud, that anatomy is destiny. There's something destined uh, or normative about evolving into the gender binary or into heterosexuality, a kind of contestation that, that goes very deeply into kind of really liberatory theories of gender, but is also part of like an, an emergent feminist movement that would say that there's, there's something in fact very much about nurture and about society and culture that expects women to perform in a certain way and men to perform in another way that isn't at all simply biological. Um, so there's a lot to say here. Maybe I'll save that for the chat. And just to, to gesture to the fact that Smith is at the, at the kind of crux of this in the way that he uses bodies inside of his work in a landscape that's thinking about how to liberate the body from civilization and societies. Um, incredibly controlling, maybe conformist post-war landscape. This is a photo that Jack Smith takes um, or has taken of himself lying down, covered in a gossamer fabric. He called them goosies. He's wearing khaki pants. They're pulled down towards his thighs so that his ass is exposed. His ass is pressed up against this mirror that is covered in this kind of dripping white residue. You can see in the mirror the reflection of the photographer who's operating the camera. That photographer is also wearing these khaki pants. So there's these all these kind of doublings and triplings going on in, in the way that these figures are dressed and also posed. This scene, this photograph is taken in the courtyard of an Upper East Side apartment where the filmmaker Ken Jacobs worked as a janitor. Jacobs had brought a number of performers up to this site in order to film part of his, his ongoing work, Star Spangled to Death. And it's in the downtime of filming that Jack Smith would take some of his earliest photographs. So there's this really interesting way in which Smith is intervening in the landscape of experimental cinema in order to create these tableaus. And yet he sees these photographs as very much part of what this movement of young filmmakers, filmmakers associated with the film cooperative, which was founded by Jonas Mikas, are doing. In his journal from 1962, he writes to the general public, all of the poetic young filmmakers at the film co-op have been making dirty nude movies lately because we are told not to, naughty, aren't we? You think so, you think we are naughty to look at bodies, think about our organs, apply the process of our intellect and imagination to determining what the body's needs are, to be led by our bodies. You are led by your body, Village Voice reader. He's imagining publishing this in the Village Voice. Whether you know it or not, most of the conflicts of your lives come from the discrepancies between what your bodies demand and your crabbed gratification. So this real tension between the materiality of the body and social or cultural expectations. 
all of this comes to a head in Smith's most famous work, which is a film called Flaming Creatures, shot over the summer of 1962 in and around the Lower East Side where Smith lived, um, and uh, premiering in the spring of 1963 at the Bleecker Street Cinema. Flaming Creatures is noted for its subversive play with the conventions of gender and sexuality, which moved against the conformity of the post-war period. Flaming Creatures was not Jack Smith's first film project, though it was one of the first times that stepping into the role of the director, he marked a departure from years of his, of his artistic life that were largely dedicated to photography and to performance, that is, performing in other filmmakers' works. While it was shot in and around the Lower East Side, the, the theme or the topic of Flaming Creatures is really Hollywood monsters and Hollywood cinemas. We see a number of vampires and zombies and mummies and femme fatales animating this film. And the story is essentially a series of vignettes of these old Hollywood monsters who break through the cinematic barrier and end up in a kind of uh, celebratory dance party. So it's pretty easy to understand the kind of queer undertones of the work, that in some ways, this is a film that begins with all of these outcast figures framed in, in, in uh, almost isolation, who then end up in this revelrous affair where they discover the collective joy in being outsiders. All of this is made more complex by the fact that the narrative is anything but um, well-structured. It's very loose and slow moving. The film itself is um, a degrade, has this degraded quality. So it's really hazy and hard to see. Um, there's a, a soundtrack that doesn't totally sync up with the video images that we're seeing. It's disrupted by this moment called the earthquake orgy scene where there's this um, shattering. Um, I'll show you some images of this. This breakdown of the film happens where all these bodies appear to be writhing and jiggling. Sheila Bick, who's the star of the film, has her breast out and it, and it begins the earthquake scene by being jiggled by a number of other performers, inflaming creatures. There's screaming going on, which you actually can't hear in this. There's a soundtrack and this whole thing is shot by having Jack Smith perched on a ladder looking down at all of these performers laying on top of one another and he's actually shaking the camera. They're lying actually quite still and he's dripping frat bits and pieces of plaster over them. And, and this sort of signifies the kind of breakdown, the crumbling of the cinematic infrastructure. The earthquake orgy scene is the best evidence of what Jack Smith um, would become known for, which was this kind of combination of ecstasy and agony of bodies rising and this pseudo erotic scene where all of their kind of infrastructure as individual beings breaks down. If you watch the earthquake orgy scene over and over, you'll see legs and arms and noses and eyes kind of jutting in at different angles. So it's really this kind of like hybrid creature that emerges from this space. Um, the, the, the earthquake orgy scene is also what most often gets referenced in the celebration of frame, frame, flaming creatures because it's so hard to read. So you have a number of critics who step in and celebrate how flaming creatures is so sensorial. It's like shocking and almost nauseating to watch this scene. And yet it's really hard to make sense of. And because of that, it, it's, it expresses a kind of sensual experience that is beyond meaning. This is how Susan Sontag describes it. She describes it a triumphant example of an aesthetic vision of the world that has yet to be understood in this country. So there are some critics who really celebrate the breakdown of meaning in Flaming Creatures. And then there are others who consider this kind of very messy, chaotic use of the camera as a total abandonment of, of cinematic technique and really kind of um, immaturish use or amateurish use of the camera. Amos Vogel describes Flaming Creatures as an intentional ignorance of technique that is elevated to the level of ideology. 
And both Susan Sontag and Amos Vogel are debating the aesthetic merits of the film, while at the same time, there's a conversation about how the appearance of drag, of naked bodies, of limp penises, of jiggling breasts is considered erotic in a way that might be liberatory, but also that raises concern around state censors, obscenity, and pornography. And it's by 1964 that Flaming Creatures is deemed obscene by New York State. Screenings are prohibited. The film is not allowed to be distributed or circulated. And it's in this particular moment that Flaming Creatures becomes a celebrated cause of the counterculture movement. What ends up happening is that Flaming Creatures gets taken up as a cause celebre of the sexual liberation and um, freedom of expression. It gets taken up particularly by Jonas Mikas, the found founder of the Filmmakers Cooperative, who stages a number of screenings with the intention of enticing the police to come and seize the film and shut down the screening. Mikas is arrested on several occasions for this screening. Jonas Mikas actually stages a very famous screening where Ken Jacobs is the projectionist, Ken Jacobs being a filmmaker who was one of the earliest directors of Jack Smith. Um, and both Jacobs and Mikas are arrested and it goes to trial and Susan Sontag testifies at the trial and has to testify to the aesthetic merits of the film. There's a performance of Flaming Creatures at Naklo Zoot, a, a, fest, a film festival in Belgium, where the censors refuse to screen the film. And so Mikas screens the film in his hotel room. So there really is the sense that Flaming Creatures and the ability to show Flaming Creatures was at the horizon of this kind of incredibly political struggle to free the body, to free up other ways of thinking about gender and sexuality. And what ends up happening with this is it filters even into college campuses, so that for years, Flaming Creatures is something that people want to see, have trouble seeing, and will stage screenings of as a kind of political protest. All of this happens without Jack Smith's interest or permission. In fact, it becomes very um, uh, uh, kind of sour about the way in which all of this politicization around Flaming Creatures occludes the ability to look closely at what his art is all about, and um, actually explore the film itself. It's really notable that Flaming Creatures, because of the way it was supported by the Filmmakers Co-op, continues to be distributed by Jonas Mikas. In 1964, Flaming Creatures was the most rented film from the Filmmakers Cooperative and accounted for 19% of that organization's revenue, which are, I don't, wouldn't normally bring in numbers, but I think it's really interesting to think about just how much money and publicity was coming through this kind of scandalous display and what people were projecting onto Flaming Creatures itself. So much so that by the 1970s, Jack Smith talks about how Flaming Creatures had become, quote, a sex issue of the cocktail world. And he transforms his entire practice around this moment, refusing to let his films enter a kind of circulation that would allow for this kind of objectification, um, this taboo display. He will screen Flaming Creatures going forward, but the only way Jack Smith does this is through live editing events where he'll bring a print. He, so if, if you wanted to program Jack Smith in the 1970s to bring Flaming Creatures, you have to actually bring Jack Smith to the venue. He brings the print, he projects it, and he will live edit cutting and splicing the film reel, layering it with other still projected images and sometimes soundtracks so that each iteration of the film was a novel experience. So there was no codified way of saying this is the final cut. What we have today is actually a preserved version of Flaming Creatures that was discovered by Jerry Tartaglia um, after Jack Smith's death. And it, and it kind of circulates as this 40 minute epic as if it has a final form, but the real Flaming Creatures has no final form. Um, all of this is of concern to Jack Smith, not only because of the money, but because of the way it keeps his name and his artistic reputation in the papers as the artist who defies gender and sexuality. And this goes all the way to the Supreme Court when a print that is shown at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor by a student group ends up being confiscated by the police. That police department is contacted by Strom Thurmond when he's trying to block the appointment of Abe Fortas to, to be Supreme Court justice. Um, and they add, like Strom Thurmond asks 
the Ann Arbor Police Department to send flaming creatures to the Senate so they can screen it and show just how perverse this film is. And Abe Fortas had a connection to flaming creatures because he was against deeming it obscene in New York years before. Um, and what ends up happening is there's this screening and all of these other newspaper articles that emerge about this Senate screening. One senator is very famously quoted as saying he saw flaming creatures and he thought it was so perverse he couldn't even get aroused. Um, but there's this way in which it continues to kind of operate as a shadow over Jack Smith's career. And so this is all the kind of energy that goes into my interest in finding other ways of looking at Jack Smith's work. I think the film itself actually suggests some of the ways in which we might, other ways we might look at what Jack Smith is doing and still including an incisive critique of gender, sexuality, eroticism, um, and, and really in dialogue with the art of the, the 19, late 1950s and early 1960s. One of those ways is to really think about how much Smith's film is about occlusion, is about the fog machines and haze and draping gossamer fabrics over cameras. So you get this quality of a very flattened image, but an image that's hyper aware of the cinematic frame through which it's operating. That none of these are attempts to render a sense of realism, a kind of real movement, a window onto another world. There's always this way in which the camera is being blocked from doing what a camera does best, which is to reproduce reality as the human eye sees it. And we see this not only in the haziness of flaming creatures, but in a number of the photographs that Jack Smith takes as well, where you can see he'll like in the image to the right here, there are both like an incredible play of light, really brightly lit areas and dark shadowy areas that are hard to make out. And then these drapings of gossamer fabric that create yet another panel behind which there's a suggestion that there might be more hidden in the image. And I like to think about this work, if I can, by moving into a conversation with some of the big players in uh, American art and thinking about abstraction um, during the 50s and 60s. So here's where I'm getting a little playful because I'm bringing in someone like Clement Greenberg who talks, of course, I'm sure many of you would, would understand or know or have thought through Greenberg's outsized influence on American abstraction. Um, and he talks a lot, of course, about the importance of a painting and in its abstraction, thinking about the purely plastic or abstract qualities of the work of art, meaning form, color, line, shape, but refusing representation, refusing figuration, refusing illusion, all of these things. I wanna be clear that there, there isn't much useful in Greenberg's criticism that's directly uh, influential for thinking about gender and sexuality at play in Jack Smith's work. Indeed, many would consider the two as opposites or antitheses in the field of American art. Whether working in photography, film, or live performance, Jack Smith's work teams with an overwhelming number of influence and materials. He packs with content and form a reflection on the world in which he inhabited. By contrast, Greenberg is best known for his staunch commitment to artistic autonomy, to the painting's independence from the world around it. It did so, it exert, painting exerted its independence, as Greenberg would suggest, on the purely plastic or abstract qualities of the work, as I said, while resisting illusion, that is resisting any kind of fixed relationship to depth or dimension that allow, would allow a painting to act as a kind of uh, a surrogate, a window in, into uh, another world. So what I have to offer is uh, just a few misreadings of Greenberg, we could say, and my justification for this misbehavior would rest on the hypothesis that by looking at Greenberg's theory of art through the framework of Jack Smith's practice, we might glean a sense of what in the dominant artistic discourse of Smith's time, which was again, the 1950s into the early 1960s, at least that's the period I'm looking at today, what in that period might have been recuperable for more than mere survival of a queer and trans aesthetic. In his most widely read essay, The Avant-Garde and Kitsch, Greenberg describes the formalism of his work in almost political terms as a training in critical looking and experimentation with painterly practice that refused both the indoctrination of mass culture and prescribed techniques of academic painting. Both the critique of mass culture and consumerism, as well as the rejection of technique, 
are virtues that we could certainly associate with Jack Smith and the whole group of the filmmakers co-op who were in many ways not interested in re repeating technique or skill or um, modes that may, they might have inherited from the past. In modernist painting in 1961, Greenberg's far less political po polemic, which was maybe a reflection on its situatedness in the Cold War era and all of that paranoia, is no less sharp in its demands for modern art that is critically self-aware of its own material conditions. It's in modernist painting that Greenberg famously cites Edouard Manet as the preeminent modernist for his use of the flat picture plane, describing Manet's attention to flatness as an enlightened, quote, intensification, almost the exacerbation of, self, of the self-critical tendency of the philosopher. Greenberg's modernism is rooted in Manet and specifically the latter self-conscious paintings that both depict the emergence of an opulent and superficially fashion-driven scene around the fin de ciel bourgeoisie in France, at the same time that he gestures to the superficial nature of the painting's two-dimensional surface. So if we look at something like this portrait of Irma Brunner by Manet, we see a woman in profile, a very flat depiction of this woman in profile, but one that also puts her in profile so that we can see things like the ornateness of her pink collared blouse, the touch of red on her lips, and especially the very fashionable voluminous black hat that she's wearing. These elements end up in Jack Smith's work, or at least referenced in Jack Smith's work in some way, where they also play with this question of layering and fashion and the mutability of the body, all of the kind of material elements we bring around ourselves in order to display not only gender and sexuality, but class and race as well. We see Irma Brunner reproduced in this Manet book that features prominently in this tableau that Jack Smith created, otherwise surrounded by panels of fabric laid on the ground and draped in the background. All of this is part of what Jack Smith is interested in in its relationship to Hollywood, that, that Hollywood wasn't only about glamour, but a glamour that was being perpetually marketed to subjects so that movies were being used in their technicolor fascination to sell colored lipstick through organization or through companies like Helena Rubinstein, and that those lipsticks were also suggesting that lips shouldn't be flesh, but that they should be silk. Um, there's a, I, I don't have time for this now, but uh, just gesture to the idea that in Flaming Creatures, this incredible moment where the whole film is disrupted by this mock commercial for a product called Indelible Lipstick, where you hear the drag superstar Mario Montez sell indelible lipstick to the consumer, which is shaped in the shape of a heart and will give you the perfect shape of the lips. And it's indelible, so it will never come off. And at some point, Jack Smith interjects and says, what kind of lipstick doesn't come off when you're sucking cock? And Mario Montez responds, indelible lipstick. And Jack Smith says, but how is a man supposed to get lipstick off his cock? And Mario Montez says, well, the lipstick is not supposed to be on the cock because it's indelible lipstick. So it's supposed to stay on the lips. And so there's this sense that there's this kind of fixing of the lips that focuses on the kind of virtue of the product, but in no way questions the cock sucking that's at the heart of this kind of narrative of selling this product of indelible lipstick. Um, now, the, the kind of use of all of this Hollywood glamour is, is certainly evident in Jack Smith's work. He models a number of his early photographs on old pu Hollywood publicity films. And, and the sense that makeup and the beauty industry was one space in which the plasticity of the body was coming through is certainly evident in Hollywood as well, where a star like Maria Montez isn't simply a star, but a star that is well known to have been created by the whole Hollywood machine, even by her own self-mythologizing. And there's something quite interesting about the way in which Smith um, recreates these Hollywood figures who themselves are kind of uh, fabrications, technological inventions, um, as a, a kind of mode of, of kind of um, vibrancy for someone like Mario Montez, a drag superstar who becomes known for the way in which he embodies the spirit of Montez in Jack Smith's films. 
but that this isn't at all dissimilar from the ways in which the beauty industry and fashion were selling these products that were all about form and shape and line and contour to the everyday consumer. There's a, a wonderful audio performance in Jack Smith's archive where Mario Montez goes through narrating all of these made in form bra commercials, this I dreamed of campaign where you have women wearing made in form bras and dreaming that they're a knockout or dreaming that they're having a swinging time or dreaming that you know they're, they're inhabiting all of these roles in the boardroom as um, construction workers, that there's something about the made in form bra that allows women to both transgress these spaces that are filled with a kind of um, expectation about gender, but that also the made in form bra allows one to dream past the limitations of how society and culture might otherwise position the gendered or sexualized subject. Um, this is the, um, and that all of this is similarly featured in Jack Smith's photographs, where we have not only the kind of beauty industry that's suggested by Manet's early portraits, or the lipstick that we see referenced in Flaming Creatures. But if you look at all of the photographs that are included in this work, like the photographs inside of the photograph Jack Smith takes, you'll find a narrative about all of this, um, this sense of the plasticity of the body in the 1960s, including in the background of the figure, you can see this kind of flexing muscle man. That's an advertisement for Joe Widener's introductory power pack muscle building course. So it's part of the physique magazines that have been well documented as part of, of a kind of emergent queer public culture in the 1950s and 60s. Um, maybe for the sake of time, I'll actually just skip over um, this section. And I just wanna play for you um, uh, an audio clip really quickly that I, I said I would get to. Um, and then maybe I'll see if there's some questions. I can always go back. But um, sorry, I'm going to pull this up. It's going to take me a second to just switch out of one thing and into another. Um, so what I'm trying to gesture to is the idea that, that's, that Smiths um, can be seen as really taking up some of the discourse around abstraction um, and, and repurposing it. Um, in his work. And um, if I had more time, I would talk through some of the ways in which Smith does this precisely by inserting bodies back into the composition of his works, that the body as a site of abstraction becomes a really interesting kind of tool for Jack Smith. And it, it's hardly about the kind of narratives that he gives to gender or sexuality in the 1960s that catapults pulls him to infamy. In fact, it's actually the way in which he doesn't narrativize these things that becomes a problem for many. Homophile movements throughout the 1960s, um, when they learn of flaming creatures, uh, many of them want to screen the film, thinking that it somehow has this kind of queer politics to it. And there are letters of people being disappointed that there isn't a more overt homosexual story inside of flaming creatures. So there's something really interesting about the way in which Smith resists that kind of representation. Um, but he does introduce narrative to some of his work, and it's precisely in these audio performances that have gotten very little play, but are part of Jack Smith's archive, where he writes these mytho mythological stories about himself and all of the other creatures, we could say, that inhabited his world. One of them being um, the um, star Francis Francine, who starred in a number of Jack Smith's early performances. And he tells this beautiful story about Frankie Francine, um, getting a suitor on Halloween who offers to pay for Frankie to go to Miami for a few weeks, a, million, a millionaire who pays for Frankie to go to Miami for a couple of weeks and uh, to buy anything that she wants. Um, uh, and that includes a number of evening gowns. And that's where the evening gown orgy top, uh, 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 theme or title comes into my work. Um, at first, Jack Smith goes with Frankie to Miami, and you can hear him talking about, Jack Smith talking about um, or, or narrating the experience of going to buy evening gowns with Frankie in the department store. And so that's the first clip that I'll just play a, a, a few seconds of. Eyes were wide and thick off her breath, but didn't say anything. Her eyes were wide and fixed on Frankie. You see, said Frankie, I'm in theatricals. And indeed, she used to be in theatricals. I mean, in her carnival days. 
when she was Francis Francine, hermaphrodite star of sideshows. She went on to make it seem as if she didn't want to buy an evening gown, but she was thrown by circumstances into the position of having to. She, in fact, wasn't the least interested in evening gowns as her. So let's just pause this here for time and, and say, you know, what, what we're hearing is Smith narrate this experience of going to the department store with Frankie um, to um, uh, performers, artists, queer figures whose bodies register as male inside of a department store looking for evening gowns and having to pretend they're not interested, giving the narrative that they're in theatricals and that it's costuming that they're looking for. So having to kind of repress the excitement of the evening gown experience. Um, but all of this is far more narrative than we get in a lot of other Jack Smith works. And I think part of that is because the visualization of it is really left up to the viewer. What ends up happening on the other side, and this is where I'll end the talk, um, is that they go back to the apartment where they're staying and they're having the evening gowns delivered and they're so excited, they can't wait, they order caviar, they eat, they take a nap, and then it's finally time for the evening gowns to arrive. I woke up when I heard people talking. The delivery boys were bringing our EGs. Frankie was being upset by the delivery boys. When they were gone, her nerves were badly shaken. I tried to be calm and comfort her. Frankie, dear, uh, let me make you some nice coffee and we'll lap up some chocolate eclairs, I said, to take her mind off the delivery boys. An hour later, and she was all right again, and cheerful. We realized with a thrill, though, that we had to try on our EGs. So we ran into the living room and snatched open all the boxes and had an EG orgy, trying them on. When I wanted to attract her attention, I would let off a scream. And uh, she started screaming too. Soon we were both screaming out of overstimulation. The room simply shimmered with shrill screams. Then I think I got high, or reality disappeared, and I seemed to be struggling for breath in a sea of evening gowns, and I thought that a volcano was going to erupt EGs, and I realized that I could only wear one at a time, and so I had to choose one to climb up the sacred volcano in. I kept screaming at Frankie that we would all be showered with red hot liquescent flaming EGs. Then I sunk senseless to the floor, the white fur rug floor in a tight silver and black sequin job, and I lay there moaning and laughing as I imagined that each evening gown came to life with the appropriate movie queen in it, and we were all accusing each other of being whores and streetwalkers and screaming at the top of our gilded lungs. And so um, before I take questions, just to say, like, what I love about this section is the way in which it falls into and out of figuration, into and out of a kind of abstraction. The desire to wear all the gowns at once, their kind of reanimation by the, the, the ghosts of the Hollywood stars that Smith and, and Frankie imagine these dresses being, that, that the body is constantly coming into and out of focus um, in various ways. Um, through this narration and that it, it just gives this beautiful picture of like this white fur rug surrounded or kind of filled with all of these evening gown dresses of different colors, almost like this kind of um, abstract, um, I almost imagine it like a Helen Frankenthaler horror painting surrounding the world. Um, I cut a bunch of stuff short, but I don't want to leave, cut the audience short if there are questions um, or anything I could go back to, I'm happy to go back. And, and answer questions about Jack Smith's work. Thank you so much, Josh. That was like really, really, really fascinating. And I think it's a really interesting way to think about how in a sense like Jack Smith's work has been seen in one sense and completely unseen as a result of its hyper visibility in, in certain ways. Um, I, 
uh, yeah, and um, that I listened to that audio for the evening gown orgy when you sent it over. It always makes me smile. The end of it, it, it is really incredible. Um, I would like to start by um, kind of going into this the central kind of conceit, I'd say, of your talk and talking about this idea of abstract gender. Um, you know, a couple of things that I thought about with it is that on the one hand, there's this notion of of using abstraction, like using the history of formal abstraction to talk about gender, right? And so that connects to me, for example, to what um, Professor Getze talked about with Nancy Grossman and Ali Stoker. And there is this like direct convergence there, right? This like using that language to talk about gender. And then on the other hand, like even when I just saw the, the, um, the title of your talk, I, I, it came to mind like, what would it mean to think about gender via a kind of modernist abstraction? I like in the sense that Greenberg is talking about abstraction as a way of, say, for example, painting about the conditions of possibility of painting. What would it mean to think about gender in that way? And what a strange thing to think about even being capable of functioning as a medium like painting that you could abstract. So I guess my question would be, were, were you thinking about abstraction in relation to Smith's work more in the lineage of using the formal abstraction, you know, in the, the pre-existing artworks that, you know, kind of did that? Or, or were you thinking of it more in terms of this idea of aiming for a kind of idea of what it would mean to abstract gender and how would those potentially intertwine? Yeah. I think that's a great question. And it, it helps me, you know, go, go back to a couple of things. One is to say like, this work is being done and has been done and Professor Getze's Abstract Bodies is like such an influential book for thinking about um, um, both like theories of gender and abstract art kind of simultaneously, um, specifically in relationship to the expanded field of sculpture. Um, and that one of the things I was really interested in that I think that book does so well is that um, when I have taught or thought about abstractness, we could say, um, there is a, a kind of propensity to think about opacity and ambiguity in relationship to abstraction. And that's not the conversation that Greenberg is having, right? Um, so to really use the terms of formal abstraction of like, about like um, what an abstract work of art is to Greenberg, how influential that was, I mean, how much he was positioning art as this kind of incredible cultural force, and then what influence that might've had on, on the milieu of Jack Smith working beyond just kind of totally rejecting it. Um, and, and with the question of gender to say like, you know, that, that in some ways on a, in a different register, gender is an abstraction. Like it already is an abstraction. It's, a, it's a concept that is used in some ways to name and identify a thing in the world. And also it exerts a kind of influential force on the way that thing is formed. Right. So we live in relationship to an idea of gender and gender also lives in the way that we live it. Um, so, so like, and all this stuff is like well known in the field of gender theory. We can talk about gender performance and performativity. Um, um, but one of the things that I've been really inspired by is the push against uh, or the push um, uh, to think, rethink gender away from identity that we see in especially more recent work. Um, I was rereading Kaji Amin's um, uh, work on transmaterialism recently and thinking about how important it is to think about, you know, transness and queerness and gender and identity, not only in the framework of the kind of self-expression, but in the ways that the material conditions facilitate those relationships because um, as Amin talks about, right, um, some of us have more access to the right to privacy and protections of the state than others. And some, some, while some of us lead very exposed lives, and that's the way that Amin puts it. And I, I think that that too is a really interesting way of thinking about um, the formal, the, the, the formal abstraction in relationship to these things, because it becomes a way of saying that gender inhabits, like just like shape, color, line, form become the principles of a painting, clothing, makeup, 
dress, hair, you know, like body form, shape, like all these things are the formal elements in some way we could say um, that are all very culturally loaded. And so they become the principles that when we kind of, yeah, we could think about using them in a different way. Great. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I totally see that as kind of like, you know, classic example of like making with gender, making visible the material conditions of, you know, what you're presenting in a way. Um, yeah. And um, I, ha I also want to remind people that you can put questions in the question box. And I have a couple more. I do have a question from Professor Getsy. So I'm also going to ask that one and then see how much more time we have. So um, he asks, he says, great talk, thank you, and says, as a parallel track to your putting Smith into the context of discussions of flatness and abstraction as analogs to Smith's emphasis on the plasticity of the body and the trafficking in the image, what about one of the other hybrid modes of abstraction in this moment, that of assemblage, which was a key mode of queer art making in the mid-1950s to the 1960s, and of the rejection of high formalism? Might it be that Smith's relationship to abstraction in accord with other queer artists using abstract tactics and compositional tactics with found objects and images as a means to suggest skewed readings and other potentials, this might reinforce your provocation of seeing Smith and Greenberg together. Yeah. Uh, thank you, um, David. And that's just such a brilliant um, reading. Like, of course, and also a reminder that like there are plenty of queer um, and trans artists in the field of high modernism and abstraction and in the rejection of it. Um, um, there are abstract painters who fit right into the fold and have been part of this discourse for a long time. We're only exploring their, the, the relationship to their, their own relationship to gender and sexuality differently now. Um, there's a moment where Jack Smith um, actually meets, kind of collides with Hans Hoffman um, uh, through Ken Jacobs, who's a student of Hans Hoffman in the summer of 1961. I skipped over this whole section in Provincetown. Um, and I was looking at um, uh, Lee Krasner's use of collage um, as a student of Hoffman and how that also has such a kind of visual corollary to the photograph Smith takes in the scene of Lincoln Center. And so I think it's a, a brilliant way of thinking about the kind of rips and the ruptures. Um, that were provocations in that old time, to, that in that in that exact time to think past Greenberg, because of course he was not uh, as as influential as he might have been, was not beloved, right? Um, so um, thank you for that, and it's something to go explore further. Um, I think we might have time for like just one last question before we run over time, and and the one I just wanted to draw it back to a question that came up in um, Professor Getzi's talk, which was this question about the strategy of the use of perversity, like throwing back perversity into the face of, you know, the, in the most general sense, like the police, right, you know, in, in the broadest sense, um, and how that was both an effective kind of transgressive strategy and the possibility and brought on the possibility of bringing on violence. And it, it, it occurs to me, like when I think about like Jack Smith's interest in these sheltered spaces of film and then kind of think about that in connection to another ambition which does seem which is very Greenbergian right of abstraction as a kind of autonomy as a kind of way to create a space of autonomy that there seems to be also maybe you're gesturing at this like second strategy that's very different than the strategy of like throwing back perversity but actually an almost protective strategy of finding this other space, I don't know. I'm just throwing it out there. I'm just curious what you think about that. Yeah. I, I love that. I think it's something worth, I mean, it, it's in the 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 uh, evening gown de la dame or whatever it's called. I'm, I'm not looking at it right now, but um, where they move between public and private space, the narrative moves between public and private space and, or, or the kind of insularity of, I wouldn't even call it private space. It's like the insularity of someone's loft, just the right environment where there's enough autonomy um, from the policing gaze of, of American culture in the, in the 1950s and 60s. So there's something really to think about there. I mean, Jack, I will say, was very against the reading of his work as perverse or obscene in any way. It was very clear that like the, the idea that there's something perverse about flaming creatures um, only perpetuates the perversity and the ostracization of the queer um, kind of world it tries to articulate. 
He'll later on do these photos where he displays himself standing in front of the wall that says, how can a queer escape the mocking laughter of wealthy normals when they visit his very rejection sewer home to get art? So the dialectic that's push and pull that like being the outside is the thing that is desired and that that's remaining at like this, that is exactly what he's pushing against. And so he, in his writings, um, loves to frame perversity as the perverse thing is American consumerism and society. I mean, he has a great essay called Notes on Pornography, where he says, like, the most pornographic thing is watching a model have to drink a Coca-Cola and faint exhaustingly, like, and look beautiful and do all these things simultaneously just to sell a product. Which is really funny to hear, because in a way, it does sound a little bit like avant-garde and kitsch, right? Like, yeah. there is this <laughs> echo there, which is very <laughs> Funny. Anyway, yeah. So, um, yeah, thank you again so much. This thank was you. really, really wonderful. And I just want to let everyone know again that we have another talk this week on Thursday on the 22nd. And I hope you all um, can join us. And yeah, thank you again. And hope you all have a good day. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.